Hey guys, it's JT Tran, and I am here with a special guest, Zachary Schwartz, a uh, freelance Playboy magazine writer that I recently shared on with all my people because he wrote about me and ABCs of Attraction. So thanks for coming on, Zach. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy to be here. The, you've been sitting on this story for a long time, right? Yeah. And, and um, with Playboy itself, almost like six months. Um, mm hmm what was the, the the birthing process like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like in in mainstream culture, a lot of people really care about a lot of different minority issues, and they should, and, that, and that's a good thing. But the issue of Asian masculinity um, is very ignored and, and looked over and, and sort of dismissed, even you know mocked uh, to a degree. Um, and I think that you know, um, even even with Asian men and Asian women. Uh, I think I believe that there's more Asian female CEOs uh, uh, than Asian male CEOs. Uh, um, Asian women in general uh, have a lot of privilege in America. You know, white people, white men love Asian women, um, but it gets to a point where Asian men are totally ignored. Um, they're feminized, and what I've seen in the media when pitching this type of story, um, we actually talked about the way we met was because I did a story on Asian men, black women dating for Vice, um, and that story was actually originally for a different publication, a much smaller publication, and it was through two white editors, and it was about to get published, and then it got killed at the end, um, because I think that, that they just, at the end of the day, they just didn't get it, they were upset at it, because it sort of implicated white people in, um, you know, why Asian men have been feminized, why black women have been masculinized, um, and I ran into that with this story as well, pitching a story about Asian masculinity, pitching a story about Asian pickup artists, it's like, a lot of editors, their heads would explode because you're talking about. <laughs> they just didn't get it. You know, you know, you're talking about Asian masculinity, which people sort of don't want to acknowledge that that's happened. You're talking about a pickup artist, which a lot of people have these preconceived notions of. And I have those preconceived notions, and I think that, to be fair, a lot of those are true about certain pickup artists. And I talked about in the article Julian Blanc, these white pickup artists um, who who are who are, are disgusting human beings, um, but. Uh, it's funny because that Asian men, black women dating piece, and then this piece itself, when it was ran through editors of color, uh, you know, the Asian men, black women dating piece, it was a black guy and an Asian guy. This piece, it was an Indian guy and a uh, black woman. Uh, my editor for this piece was Anita Little, who was super open-minded. She was great. She was excellent. So was Shane Michael Singh, who was the executive editor for this piece. Um, so when you see sort of minorities in those editorial positions, they usually get it a lot more than other people who were, who were in editorial positions. Yeah. So that was how this, this piece came about. Yeah. I was about to say, I found the right editor. I, I, I say it half jokingly that, um, this is maybe the first article, positive article about Asian men in Playboy magazine since Bruce Lee. Now, I don't know if that's actually true, but it, it kind of feels like it. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. When you post. Yeah. Yeah. You were getting pushback, so you shopped this around to like um, Vice and, and to Esquire and to other places. Uh, I imagine though, like the, the pushback from those editors can't, can't fail into the two camps. Either it was about Asian masculinity, which they didn't give two shits about, right? Or it's like, oh, yeah. it's pickup artists, so we were like, we're totally anti that, uh, or some sort of like toxic yeah. mix of both. You want to talk a little bit about like just without naming names or anything like that, obviously, what like, you know, that obviously contributed to why it took so long to get this story like out there. And so how, somehow it ended up in Playboy of all places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've pitched editors with the Asian masculinity issue before and they've been like, well, you know, um, I don't know what you're talking about because um, it was actually funny because one editor actually brought up Asian women. He said, I know plenty of Asian women who are well adjusted and you know these you know so I don't I don't really know what this issue of was going on with Asians. Um, so yeah, I mean it just takes finding the right editor, someone who's open minded. Um, and and a lot of these editors did want uh, this sort of bias. You know, I I went an open minded because I would like to do that with all stories is going open minded. Um, but they were like, make sure you cr you know show that this doesn't work. Um, you know, make sure that you show that pickup artistry doesn't work. And I was more like, okay, well, let's see what let's see what we have here. You know, I think that there's obviously an element where if 
someone selling you a dream, people selling dreams in general, you know, are not to be trusted. But if someone's selling you improvement, um, it's like how to win friends and influence people. If you can learn how to become more charismatic, uh, I found out that you know through through talking to you through my research, you can obviously find out how to be more persuasive and attractive active to the opposite sex and that's women and men and men and women and everything in between you know a girl i know girls who, who've read books on seduction so and it, this is sort of the the hypocrisy i think of the media is uh is that like it's okay for women to learn seduction of men but it's not necessarily okay for men to learn seduction of women and i understand that there's like different standards you know men can be manipulative you know that it's, it's so often you know, men try to manipulate women into sleeping with them. But I think it's a subject worth exploring. Exploring. Yeah. So, And there's obviously, like, you know, a, a different power structure at play, right, um, that makes, Definitely. you know, yeah. the manipulation more potentially harmful. It's, a, it's completely, you know, I, I get that. And it will, I definitely want to address, like, you know, your what you perceived pickup coming in, that somehow this story ended up at Playboy, which is this, you know, bastion of white masculinity, Right. And like white womanhood. It landed there because like you're saying your editors were people of color. And so you think that's like essential as to why this story and other stories like this can can get in. Because you're I think, you know, before this, you're talking about like how some other places that they were sort of like, you know, these white male liberal crusaders that are like, oh, you know, Asian women are fine. But, you know, Asian guys shouldn't have any problems. Yeah, yeah, I've always found my allies with uh, with pitching any Asian masculinity issue in general are always people of color. It's always black women, black men, Asian men, Asian women, um, and and all credit, uh, you know, to the editors of this piece. Uh, you know, Anita Little, Shane Michael Singh from Playboy. Um, you know, for even I mean, I, and I don't even know if their politics necessarily were supportive of pickup, and I don't even know if my you know, wow, that's a whole nother another thing but um they were open-minded you know they get it you know I, they understand what if you if you understand discrimination um racial discrimination you can empathize with someone else more readily but if you're not if you've never experienced that you might just sort of you know you're just taking positions that are like convenient or that seem good to the rest of your your group mm-hmm. seem good to the rest of the other minorities or something like that you're just sort of gonna follow fads um so yeah yeah. All right. Um, so, you know, thankfully we got the story published, but kind of circling all the way back and to the origin. So like you were saying originally, how I think we, we ended up somehow connecting over that vice story, Asian men, black women. And then we, we talked and um, you sat in uh, at one of my boot camps. So for our, our audience, yeah. like, Coming in, you know, you know, I know like your your last name is Schwartz, but for our audience, you're actually you're you're Hapa, which you're, you're half Asian, right? So you kind of have one foot in the yeah, white world, one foot in the, the Asian world. Um, but coming in, what was your perception of Asian masculinity? How you related to that, as well as your perception of what pickup art, you know, was like? Like you said, that that skepticism is this snake oil? Or is this real? Yeah. Well, I felt passionate about Asian masculinity. And, and I had done issues on it before because it's sort of this awakening moment when I got to college that I realized that a lot of my issues and sort of self-esteem issues had to do with the fact that growing up in Ohio, you know, I don't know if I, I you know, I can never tell how Asian I actually look, but growing up in Ohio, I looked pretty Asian. People saw me as Asian. People called me chink, uh, you know, Chinese, but, but, you know, they called me the first word, which is a very harmful word, you know, that destroyed me when, when someone called me that for the first time. Um, so... I had sort of went to college and realized that a lot of my issues about being a guy, I like sort of the way I saw myself, um, and I wrote about in the article, is that I sort of took this role in my own friend group, um, and, and so did the other Asian guy, which is crazy, he was this Indian kid of sort of these like unmasculine, uh, you know, unsexual, like, you know, we had our first kisses later than everyone else, we were sort of comic relief, um, and that, a lot of that had to do with the way that I perceived myself you know I, I looked at myself as Asian I, I, you know, I thought I had to play a role um, and then I went to college and thankfully all that disappeared you know I had a girlfriend I had girlfriends um, I had a great time but I, so I felt passionate about that you know and, and I saw that Asian kids I grew up with um, in Ohio and how screwed over they were I mean these are kids who never had girlfriends um, they were incels uh, you know involuntary celibates um, 
And it was 100% because they were Asian, because girls didn't look at them the same, because they had just grown up without the same social skills. And then secondly, pickup artistry, you know, I thought that was a joke. I, I thought that, um, and I would never, I wouldn't identify as someone who's a pickup artist or anything like that. But if someone was talking about how horribly I thought pickup artistry was, I would say, well, it's the art of attraction. I mean, Robert Greene wrote a book, The Art of Seduction, and the art of seduction is a thing that anyone can relate to. Um, I think that if it's not manipulative, you know, and if some guy needs it, uh, it can be a positive thing, the way that how to win, fr- win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie is a positive thing to give to someone who's totally uncharismatic. Um, and But yeah, I mean, my perception of it was like those pop-ups you get where it's like, I'm going to teach you how to seduce the women of your dreams in 30 days. Uh, and I thought that was junk. I thought that was, you know, I was intrigued, but I was like, of course, this is a scam. Um, and then I, I went to, uh, then we met, met up and I learned more about the boot camp. I, t- I, you know, I observed the boot camp and I saw a bunch of virginal Asian guys uh, get some real, uh, you know, dating advice. That was what the article was about. <laughs> it was even things like, I mean, it's something like smile. Like, I remember I had a very charismatic friend in my, in my college. And I was always like, how do you get everyone on your side? Uh, you know, how does everyone like you? And I remember we had an interaction with some like person and, and this person was like rude, kind of rude to me and I was kind of rude to them. And we walked away and he was like, dude, you didn't smile at all during that whole interaction. And then I, I was like, oh, so I should always smile. And then I started smiling and that always helped me from then on. And then, you know, that's, that's dating advice. That's teaching that's dating coaching i mean i i would I, I you talked about that i mean smiling is something that's positive so uh even teaching someone to do that you know it's self-improvement you know someone can get better at literally anything including social things and it kind of bothers me uh and that's sort of why i wanted to write that article it was like people who are practicing self-improvement or like i don't know I, I, I told about that you're art, you know, about this article before it came out, and, and sort of you, and, and they were sort of immediately like, "What the hell? Like, what's going on?" Um, and that's why I did want to write the article is to be like, "Well, yeah, pickup artists can be a totally scummy thing, but hold on, we're working with a totally different power dynamic here. We're dealing with a racial dynamic. We're dealing with something where it's like, you know, it might not. It's not like the negging. It's not like you know, I'm saying negative things to someone. So just to explain the entire background and the situation of the boot camp that you came in on. We actually had like eight students, but two of them didn't want to be part of the story for privacy reasons. And three were Asian, two of them who were like Fabi Asian. And then we had like three Caucasian students. One was like European, the other two were like like normal Americans. And you know, one of them was like Trevor, who was like that six foot tall, like good looking white guy, right? Um, and so it wasn't meant to be like a pseudo competition or anything like that, but it, it was like, you know, part of me was definitely a, proud not only did like my students get like a lot of results but like the Asian students they all hooked up right and you know they actually did you know a little bit better than our Caucasian students so you know I want all my students to do well but I definitely felt like you know kind of rooting for for my Asian students like the underdog yeah well I think I think Asians are the only people are the only like guys that are like more have I think have a moral impetus like, and are, like, morally justified in, like, hooking up with, like, as many people as they can. Uh, not to say that all Asian guys should do that, but I think that if you're, like, spreading, you know, you're spreading love, you know, you're, you're giving girls who might never have had a positive impression of an Asian guy a positive imp- impression of an Asian guy. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, like, a thing that Asian guys should be successful in dating. And, you know, it's sort of like a, a it's like a... It's like morally justifiable for an Asian guy to be a, to be a playboy, and and I think in this Me Too era and in sort of I don't think it's right, right for all men to mass to measure how much of a man they are about how many women they hook up with or anything like that. But I think for Asian guys, because it's totally on the opposite end, um, I think that you know it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good. So I think the the reason for you know what the, you call that moral justification is like if you look at the difference in dating between like Asian men and Asian women, um, the studies have shown like Asian men we start dating or lose virginity when we're like twenty. That's like the average age. But if you look at like Caucasian Americans or African Americans, it's like sixteen, fifteen. Um, if you look at Asian American women, it's nineteen. And Asian American women actually have you know not only do they date earlier. Um, they have more sexual partners than Asian men. 
And we're the only like ethnic group in America where that's true, where the Asian women outperform um, sexually than their male counterpart. So it you know, goes back to what you mentioned previously, the idea of like that sort of white privilege by proxy because they are desired. Yeah. Um, and yes, it is fetishized and it's, you know, it's not all, you know, you know, unicorns and rainbows because it's still a stereotype. But at the same time, they are getting some benefit from it. Right. Yeah. And they are participating and, and in that power see, structure. And you see that too in the half Asian community um, on, you know, the Reddit subreddit, Hoppas, a shout out to the subreddit, you know, biggest half Asian community online. And, um, they have this whole list of like Asian, half Asian women that are successful and they're successful in every field. And then you have, they have a list of like half Asian men that are successful and it's like four guys. <laughs> okay. I think the first, year they did, the first year they did it, they like put me on that list. And I'm not saying I'm like a super successful person by any means. It's just like, that's not saying that like I'm special in any way. It's saying that there's such a deficiency of like half Asian role models and even mm -hmm. Asian role models that really felt the need to do. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the half Asian role, role models uh, are criminals. Not even, I, I shouldn't have said role models. Uh, half Asian notable examples are Elliot Roger and Daniel Holtzclaw, who are half Asian men who are convicted of sex crimes and murder. And in sexual rage, Daniel Holtzclaw was a horrible rapist, uh, and Elliot Roger was an incel. Um, and then you have these half Asian women that are, are like porn stars, and, and, and uh, but also, you know, beautiful uh, CEOs and, and, and very intelligent, successful women. But it's just saying that they're sexualized, you know, they can, and, and they're seen as very beautiful, um, and they can do whatever they want, you know. There's so many, you know, Olivia Munn's dating Aaron Rodgers, you know, shout out to half Asian women, they're very beautiful, they, you know, they're great, they're successful, but half Asian men are screwed over. Uh, according to Hoppas, and, and from what I've seen, uh, there are a lot of psychosocial issues that come from being a half Asian man and has a white dad and an Asian uh, mom, which is what I had, which maybe explains, you know, what's going on with me. But, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to get out of it. So right, that's right. why I try to, you know, write this stuff. Well, the thing is, it, I've, I've had half of students before. Um, and like the, the struggles that half of like you and just Asian men in general are, are very similar. I mean, there's a very large overlap. I mean, I don't really know if if growing up it's that significantly or how significant the difference is having, you know, one white parent, but you are looked upon as Asian and you are treated as Asian. And, and you know, maybe in some cases it's sort of worse in the fact that, you know, at least for me, I knew right off the bat like kind of obviously like my parents couldn't really teach me about American culture and how to fit in, you know, because they're like immigrants from Vietnam. Um, but in your case, you might have a parent, and I've heard this, I don't know about your parents, but I've actually heard this from other students where like th their dad just was like completely, not only was he oblivious, but he was like, no, you're like, you're not gonna encounter racism. You're, you're, you're basically white. It's like, no dad, I am not treated white. So, you know, I don't know if that was something that you encountered, but I've heard this, and I've heard this from, like, other students where just having that white parent, you know, that ignorance, you know, you know, sometimes even translates to, to pushback. Like, their racist, you know, experience, you know, was invalidated. Yeah, that's, that's what my dad did, definitely. You know, he would say, you know, you don't even look Asian to me, um, all this other stuff. But, uh, you know, my dad was a great, he's a great guy. Um, he's actually different than a lot of, like, white men who date, who marry Asian women. He was very knowledgeable about Asian culture. He always spoke highly of Asian men but uh yeah, yeah that was something that screwed with me because people would call me you know chink or something like that or girls would say to me like I don't like you you know you're weird looking I you know I'm not into you like like I remember a girl trying to explain to me why girls weren't into me and she was like it's just it's just like you know the way you look like you're cute but it's just like she was literally saying this and I didn't understand it then but years later I went to college and I wasn't surrounded by white girls anymore and a lot of girls ended up liking me, and then I'm looking back, and I'm like, I really think that just it just had to do with the fact that I was Asian, and and it was some of it was internal, some of it was external. Yeah, I was like foreign, and and, and that sucked, you know. And, and my friends go looking back, who've all become woke and, and know about this stuff now, tell me that they were like it was a hundred percent, you know, that 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 you were Asian and, and you were in a group of all white, you know, mostly white kids, and you know, you're among these skateboarders. I was a skateboarder growing up, and 
you know, these girls who, you know, skate girls, like, they didn't want to date an Asian guy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> so, but, <laughs> so, so, yeah, well, no, I think, I think this is where, like, we all have a very similar experience, obviously not an a, a exact experience, but, you know, it's, it's, I can de- definitely commiserate and empathize with all my HAPA students. Um, but, you know, going back, turning back to the story in, in the boot camp, like, what did you see in, in the boot camp? And if you yourself, I think you mentioned this, but, um, you know, if, if you benefited from the boot camp, just sitting and watching, not even participating like the other students, but just kind of absorbing what I was teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just observing it. Um, I definitely like, I thought it was very interesting. And then the example, I remember going back to my friends afterwards and telling them, um, I mean, they, it, it's, I mean, I think, I think that all, all this stuff, and most of the stuff, I mean, there were some very specific things you said, which I probably, you probably don't want me to say, that, you know, just like little, like, body language stuff that, that I think is, is effective, but a lot of stuff, like, you know, smile, touch, the importance of touch, um, the importance of consent, I mean, even with touching a girl, like, and, and a lot of people, and this sounds crazy to, to talk about, especially if you're talking to a girl, because you know, people would be like, oh, this is so robotic, but, um, you know, the importance of touching someone, and then if they draw back, not touching them again, that type of thing. Um, which is, which is an important, uh, you know, that's something that, that, that was discussed. Um, but yeah, I mean, before I went in, I sort of, you know, I had girlfriends. I, I was actually pretty happy with my romantic sexual life, but I, you know, I, I always thought it could get better. And then after the boot camp, uh, man, I, I think that I did pick up, I definitely did pick up stuff. I mean, after the boot camp, actually, I went on a date with this like 30 year old woman. Um, and I was in college at the time. And me and her started dating for a bit after that. Um, when I was in China the next summer, I like dated my teacher. It was like a secret affair, uh, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And and I don't think I ever told you that because because now that the article's published, now we can talk freely and stuff like that. But I didn't think I, I didn't want to tell you that because I sort of wanted to maintain this um, objectivity. Um, but yeah, I mean, talk to some people and there's totally you know uh, resistance to this idea. But a lot of guys and even some girls open-minded people who are like, mm, maybe what I can learn are always like, okay, okay, so like, tell me what you learned. And then I'll tell them and I'll always notice they're sort of listening with this sort of like, oh, like that makes so much sense. Um, you know, uh, just stuff like that. Uh, um, well, many people have asked me like, what did, what did you learn? And I'll tell them the specific stuff. And they're always very interested. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was talking to some, some friends of mine, like some white girls uh, about the story and I did a podcast with a couple of them. Uh, but it was interesting in the fact that their their perception of, of pickup is sort of dependent upon how socialized they are. If there's someone that is heavily socialized because you know men find them attractive or they're very flirty, they unconsciously understand that there are certain things. There's a, there's a subtext to all communication, right? It's just not simply the words, right? And and. We are all fascinated by what the opposite gender thinks. <laughs> like men, we, we all want to know what the woman is thinking. And women want to know what men are thinking, even though we only think about one thing, right? But they still want to know. Um, yeah. And so I, in my experience, it's usually just more highly socialized women that are just – they're very sort of neutral to pro, like the idea of just the, the you know, learning – flirtation and human interaction because that's all it is basically just with you know pickup is just human interaction you know with with intent they're part of the process right i think it's it's maybe women who aren't normally part of that process that feel you know deprived of that or more resentful just like how we asian men are resentful for the fact that we are not naturally part of the dating conversation right yeah, yeah, no, all my all my badass female friends, uh, uh, like, they all were interested in this article, and I would talk to them about it, and I actually had one, and this girl is, like, she's amazing, and she's so successful, and she gets whatever guy she wants, and she was like, oh, yeah, like, I read The Art of Seduction by Robert Greene, and I, like, do, like, the basically the girl version of, of a lot of that stuff, you know, create intrigue, create mystery, sort of, like, not be present all the time, like, not give yourself to totally... Um, and she was like, she was totally interested and she was totally into it. And she was like, word, I think that's cool. And she was, she was Indian. So she was sort of understanding the whole, you know, Asian masculinity thing. Honestly, like the biggest pushback I got from the, from like 
Asian women. And that's even it. I mean, I had a white guy, you know, message me and say uh, that he, he was like a short white guy. And he was like, like man, I, I related to them. And, and I thought it was cool that like, there's a way that you can sort of like get better, not necessarily by doing specifically, you know, each pickup artist, each dating coach, each book has something different, but just even things like, you know, smiling, being more charismatic. I think that applies to everything in life. And I think that's something that everyone should learn to, whether they want to do it in social, you know, making friends, a productive person, as long as it's not being used for like nefarious purposes or something or, you know, and, and I don't think, and that was, I don't think you never told your students to lie. I don't, I mean, I will, like, and I know that some pickup artists is very much like lying and like, um, I mean, inner game, you know, being who you are, like as a, being an attractive person rather than like deceiving someone or manipulating someone or getting them drunk, you know, that was also something that was discussed, uh, you know, not getting someone drunk, you know, actually doing like real, just being an attractive person. Yeah. So no. part of it is, is. You know, with ABCs and in, in how I got into this, right, is that power dynamic is so different, you know, when it comes to, like, Asian students, where it's that recognition where, you know, you're talking about, like, other pickup artists who can use their whiteness, you know, in, in lieu of game. They think it's yeah. game, but it's just they're white, <laughs> Right. And, you know, yeah. to them, it's it's game and they can get it's it's sort of a cheat code. It, no, it is a cheat. It's kind of like very commonly understood in the pickup community to like white guys can go to Asian clubs and pick up Asian girls. It's like super easy. They can rack up the numbers. And so without that sort of understanding of the discrimination and, and the difference in power level, it is very easy um, to go to like the Cobra Kai school of pickup. Where it's just like sweep the leg, don't care about the girl, you know, it's like, as you know, get as much results, you know, as possible, even if you're sacrificing your long term, like moral integrity. Um, but for the rest yeah. of us, you know, who don't have that privilege, right, We when we understand what it's like to be discriminated against and, and to be on like sort of the opposite end, like... I tell my students who are Asian and who are saying, oh, I don't like Hispanic girls or I don't like black girls. I tell them, like, you need to be open to dating all girls, not just Asian girls, not just white girls, but you got to be open to dating black women and Latin Latinas because just like we Asian men, we hate that that humiliating feeling of being judged by, you know, our manhood by our race and that, that sexual racial discrimination. We should not impose it upon other women, you know. So yeah, there's definitely like I do try, you know, to in, in, in impart that to the students. Um, yeah. But it's you know it, everybody's individual choice. I can only you know attempt to be a positive role model. Um, but it was interesting that uh, like you were saying, like your, the pushback that you got was mostly from like what East Asian women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. East Asian women were uh, they were just yo because I think that like there's so much hate from East Asian women towards Asian men online. I mean, there's articles where East Asian women are like, I would never date an Asian guy. And you know, I have East Asian women friends that aren't like that, that are like, yeah, I don't date white guys. I would totally date an Asian guy. And those people, you know, I love those girls to death. Like they're, they're great. But, um, I've dated, I dated this, I've dated half Asian and Asian women who like, I'm the first Asian guy they've ever been with. And they've only like ever dated white guys. And, it's just, you know, it's upsetting. And it's also like, sometimes they sort of ignore. I mean, I, I was remember talking about Asian masculinity in China with this group of Asian people. And this Asian American girl from my group was like trying to like fight me on this. And, and she was like, oh, like, you know, male, male privilege. And I was like, you know, if you understood more and like really just did like a lot of research and, and listening to like what Asian men are saying, you would realize that not necessarily for someone like me, but for other people, for other Asian guys, their mask, their male privilege is nearly canceled out by the fact that they're this sort of bumbling like stumbling east asian nerd you know it's 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 not true that other guys naturally respect them or that even women respect them they will look at them as sort of these sexual beings um so yeah there was pushback there was sort of like oh i think it's creepy i think it's weird and then i was just like okay well if you had a brother you know i know you have there was this one girl who said something to me and i was like well i know you have a brother and you talk about how socially awkward he is he doesn't leave his room he's never had a girlfriend he's 19 so what should he do and she just didn't really 
really have an answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's again, it's the idea of like of of privilege by proxy. You know, I know in the article you say that like how Asian women outmarry at a rate of something like thirty six percent. And if you narrow that down to just to like Asian American born women, like Asian American, um, that figure is actually 54%, which means literally over half of Asian American born women, they will not choose us and they will not choose us because we're, we're Asian. And so there's very real, you know, trophyism that's going on. I know there's, there's a lot of like, oh, it's like, JT, why are you teaching Asian guys only to chase white women? Because that's like, yeah, this trophyism, blah, blah, blah. I'm not only teaching them white women. I just, I'm trying to teach them how to date, period, and how to date openly. Yeah. But the real trophyism, I think, is going on in the, the when it comes to like Asian, you know, on both sides of the spectrum, like Asian women and, and white guys. And I get it. Like, quite frankly, you know, there is a lot of positive benefit for an Asian woman to marry a white guy. Like, she changes her name. Um, so all of a sudden, she's getting more job interviews. She, you know, she, she's more in a, a, a white physical space too. So she's she's gonna be safer. Um, so when it comes to money and safety and 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 politi- you know, politics, right? Political power. So I mean, I get it. You know, like who wouldn't wouldn't want to be part of that power structure and get the benefit from it? Um, but at the yeah. same time, it my is, sister. Yeah, go ahead. My my sister said. I would never date an Asian guy, like, two years ago. Whoa, your own sister. Damn. Yeah. And, you know, my sister, you know, me and my sister, you know, I love my sister, she loves me. But that was, like, I was like, what the hell? Like, and then, so if, if you're, like, you know, you have, if you're, like, a hapa like me and you have a white dad, so your sister says something like that, um, and then your mom, which, bless my, my mom's heart, she wasn't only into Asian guys. I'm talking about hop. I mean, she wasn't only into white guys. I'm talking about my hoppas in general their sister might say something like that and then their mom would have only dated asian i mean white men they were mom, their asian mom would have only dated white men so you have these hoppas uh and, and i'm sure this also extends some to the asian asian guys but you have these hoppas who like their own family rejects them people who look like them and that is deeply psychically upsetting yeah that's um that's I'm internalized cool, like, I'm racist great, shit. but hoppas are upset yeah. it's crazy yeah it's, it's very upsetting and you see these up, look about it. So I just take, you know, I have sympathy for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, the way I try to create the positive change in, in society is like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, running a business, obviously, but I've had students, and, and, you know, convert, if you will, women, Asian women, as well as just like all women of different colors to the idea that Asian men were not like, creepy or misogynistic that there are those of us who are confident and attractive you know i myself and my students have like turned asian girls that um would never give asian guys a shot i've had like you know white girls that never thought of dating asian men now all of a sudden you know we're their first one same thing with black girls and you know standing up to uh white guys that you know are in bullying or confrontational um, I think in the article you talked about yeah. how, you know, there are different parts when we're home base. We had like all these girls and people were just staring. You know, the most hostility comes when we have like white girls, right? And it's like white guys just getting sort of like simmering yeah. with anger, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, when, you know, standing up to standing up to that, presenting a, a, a good positive role model or – I have had students that have been on TV and in, gotten into politics and elected office. So, you know, I tend to ascribe to the yeah. Adam Smith kind of wealth of the nation, the, the, the invisible hand where if each individual can pursue his own happiness, then we can slowly change society, right? So um, I, I know like you yourself recommended one of your friends to take my boot camp. So, you know, thank you for that. And I, I'm yes. – I'm sure he thinks yeah. you because he got his first girlfriend, <laughs> like a virgin guy. He got his first girlfriend, so. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and, and I appreciate. I mean, and, and I I've seen it in sort of like Asian creatives, Asians in this media world that we're in. Um, do tend and the ones who aren't like super like whitewashed or aren't you know who understand what's going on and are sort of awakened to that. Um, they do tend to help each other out and stick together and, and, and get it. Um, and that's Asian women. 
Asian men too, and half Asian women and half Asian men. Um, and it's always, you know, uh, it was nice to see, you know, I, I genuinely, when I was doing the boot camp, I came in with, I didn't really try to come in with a preconception. I was actually more so excited to sort of see what was going on. And I kind of hoped that it was, it was, you know, something substantial that I could take away. Um, but I saw, you know, I appreciated it because I'm anything, I'm all for Asian empowerment. And if an Asian guy is like 25 to 30 to 35 to 40, any, any that age, and he's never really been with a girl, he's like awkward. Um, it's heartbreaking. It's totally heartbreaking. Um, and for him to know that he has an option um, of being with an Asian, of, of learning from a fellow Asian guy and being mentored by a fellow Asian guy, um, in just terms of being better with women and, and, and not coming off as creepy, not coming off as weird. Um, you know, I appreciated that. And I think that was one of the reasons why I was passionate and about and, and why I wanted to see this article come to fruition was to sort of give a different angle uh, um, and sort of, you know, you know, break a couple misconceptions, you know, um, about this industry, about Asian guys. Um, in my opinion of the industry really, really hasn't changed. Although, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that people should just be open-minded to everything in general. And I can't even say that because I'm reading, uh, Neil Strauss's, uh, the rules right now. Um, and, and it's like, it's embarrassing to admit. I mean, it's like, Oh, like, you know, I don't think I'm good enough about the subject. I just think it's interesting to learn. Um, you know, uh, it's just interesting stuff. You know, I'll read stuff about self-improvement in every other aspect of my life, in including how to be more persuasive. I just finished uh, Win Bigly by Scott Adams. So it would make sense that I would also want to read things about how to be a better partner, how to be a better romantic partner, how to come across better to people. So, Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so before we let you go, do uh, you have any last comments about just – uh, Asian masculinity, dating, or just like the story, you know, uh, in Playboy in general? Uh, no, I think that what you said about the fact that this was a profile of an Asian guy, I think it might have been, it might be the, the, the first profile of an Asian, of a po first positive profile of an Asian guy seen in a sort of a sexual, like masculine light since Bruce Lee. And uh, going off that point, because I was thinking about that, because I was, you know, I was happy about that is that I think um, I'm going to be starting to write a more regular column for them about like young love, young dating, um, that type of thing. Um, and I think that I would, and, and I was thinking about that today, and it was based off what you said, but it was like for a, a young Asian guy to be writing a column in Playboy about love and dating, um, I think would be, uh, I would be very touched by that. And, uh, you know, uh, if we do anything on pickup uh, or in general dating, stuff uh, i'll be sure to uh, give you a call <laughs> so it really real real will be asian playboy like officially <laughs> cool cool yeah yeah uh, yeah all right how how can our audience um find more information about you like you know you do twitter website what you got so oh uh twitter is the best way follow me on twitter um it's uh, Zach two times, Z-A-C-H underscore two T-W-O underscore T-I-M-E-S. Um, if you search Zachary Schwartz or Zach Schwartz on Twitter, um, you'll find that stuff. And then just, you know, Google. Uh, but yeah, just Twitter. And uh, if anyone has any questions or anything, my email is in my Twitter bio. So anyone, feel free to reach out. Sure thing. And we'll also put it on the screen and we'll put it in the description box, guys. So be sure to follow, check him out. All right, this happy writer got him into Playboy. You know, one of the bastions of white masculinity, breaking barriers. So thank you so much, Zach. All right, bye bye. JT. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun infield pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check 